Um, so thanks to Simon and Victoria for asking me to come and talk um, in this event. I'm Liz Ferguson. I'm editorial director for Life Science Journals at Wiley Blackwell, and I'm also heavily involved in all of our open access activities and have been for the last three or four years now. Um, so rigor and open access is a nice broad title to give to a talk. Um, and so I want to reinforce that we do support and encourage open access. And within that, we want to ensure that the journey that the RCUK has described for us is one in which we can maintain standards of excellence in peer review and in publishing services. And to do that requires financial sustainability supporting the system. Um, so I'm going to talk about rigor in the context of continuing the maintenance of excellence that we've known for a good long time and how that may pan out in a system that is going to be changing financially. So first of all, we know we have to provide excellence because authors demand that we provide excellence. Uh, the recent survey by Taylor and Francis of 12,000 authors or so and another one that we conducted last year with a similar number shows that rigorous peer review is, pro is either the single most or one of the top most determining factors of when an author is choosing which journal to publish in. Sometimes the impact factor still trumps it, but frequently now it's the rigor of the peer review process. I don't think there's any intrinsic reason why a business model or any model that funds scholarly communication should be more or less rigorous um, in terms of the application of peer review, irrespective of whether that peer review is traditional, whether it's open, or whether it's a kind of non-journal specific level of peer review like the services provided by Rubric or, or Peerage of Science. So I wanted to talk about three brief examples from our experience at Wiley of how we know that open access is subjected to exactly the same degree of scrutiny as our peer-reviewed content, and that the two are very much like for like at that stage of affairs. So first of all, like most publishers, we publish a large number of hybrid journals, uh, 1,200 or so now. And we first launched our hybrid service back in 2004. And between 2004 and 2011, we saw remarkably consistent take-up of that service. It was hovering at about half a percent per year of the articles that we published. 2011 to 2012, we saw a doubling of that, a little bit more than a doubling actually, and we expect it to at least double again. We put workflows in place right at the beginning of that process to ensure that authors who are going to choose to publish open access at some point don't signal that to anyone in the editorial process. So an editor is completely unaware until after the acceptance of a paper that an author may have chosen to go open access with their paper. Um, and in fact, many editors don't even look at that point. They're not too concerned about that whole thing. They're just focused on accepting the right material for their journals. So in the hybrid world, all manuscript submissions are treated to exactly the same degree of rigor and scrutiny in peer review and at the decision-making process. We've also had some experience in the past couple of years of converting some subscription journals to open access. When we've done that, uh, the editorial teams that are behind those journals have almost universally stayed exactly as they were. The editorial missions and intents of the journal have stayed exactly as they were. Um, probably one of the highest profile ones we've done of these was Embo Molecular Medicine, which went open access at the beginning of last year. Um, we saw a big uptick in submissions, which actually I think was down to a big surge in impact factor, maybe more than the change in model. But the rejection rate went up commensurately because the editors of that journal have decided that excellence and high selectivity is the cornerstone of what they want to do. So again, the change to open access has not in any way changed the rigor of the process at that particular journal or the others that we've converted. Finally, like a lot of other publishers, we also publish in a cascade system. Um, so our version of it typically is that there will be 10 to 15 normally subscription-based journals that when they're unable to accept a manuscript for any reason where the science is sound, but it's perhaps the fifth bird paper in a week that they've seen, or it's not sufficiently novel, or there's split reviews that the journal either doesn't want to try to resolve for some reason or can't resolve, they have the option of referring the manuscript along with its original reviews to an open access journal that's relatively broad scope. And at that point, a new editorial team at the Open Access Journal considers the reviews that were previously conducted along with the submitted manuscript 
and decides whether it's appropriate for them. And they're coming at it from a slightly different perspective. They're looking for authors to be able to respond to what the reviewers have said, but not necessarily to have to deal with it in the way that a traditional journal might want them to do. So not necessarily looking for reruns of experiments, not looking to present new arguments that reviewers have asked them to do, but at least to make reference to the fact that there may be disagreement about a particular point and why they've chosen to cover the angle that they have. So in that particular circumstance, the rigor of the peer review process is exactly the same as it was. The journals we've been publishing in some cases now for more than a century are determining the rigor of the peer review process, but the decision-making process at an open access journal has removed the space barrier that exists in many of the subscription journals that we publish. One thing that was important to us in coming up with that model was it wasn't just us saying that this system works, it's reliable, it's rigorous. We've had external validation of it by indexing agencies, and we've also had validation of it by increasing numbers of authors coming through. And what we're saying is quite interesting is that almost irrespective of the subject area in which we publish these journals, 12% of authors, when offered the opportunity to take their manuscript and reviews forward, are choosing to take that route. So whether it's ecology, oncology, whatever, it's 12% consistently. I'm not sure why that is, but it's just quite interesting to know. So a number of people in this audience, probably many of you, will be used to hearing about the publishers talking about how we add value. Um, so I'm going to say that we need to start demonstrating how we add that value and how that value is changing in an open access environment. So my second theme is based around rigor of service. So this is service to authors, service to funders, and to others involved in the scholarly communications process. So we are only as good as the authors who choose to submit to us. Um, and we're fortunate more and more authors still choose to submit to our journals year on year, but we're not complacent about that. We know that we have to work really hard to maintain the commitment of those who may have been choosing to publish in the journals that we published for many years, and we also have to provide support to those who are newer to academic research. This means that we have to make the publishing process easier for everybody by implementing new standards and new services that help people out throughout this process. Um, one example of this, and, and Linda made reference to this earlier, is not everyone is completely familiar yet with what the RCUK policy might mean for them. So we've had a bunch of technology people working over the past few months to develop a new licensing system, which we managed to bring into play on the 2nd of April, which it now covers about 800 of our journals. Stage two will go a lot further than that. Um, and that means that if an RCUK author has come through, had their paper accepted, is going to choose the appropriate license for their paper and has signaled to us that they wish to publish open access in a hybrid journal, or any journal in fact, they'll automatically be directed, assuming they've acknowledged they have APC funding, to the CC BY license. Other online open authors will still have a choice, but RCEK authors with funds will go straight to CC BY. And we figured that supports the funder's mission as well. Help, we're helping drive compliance with the RCEK policy. And I checked with a colleague last night who helped develop this system, and in less than a week, we had more than 1,400 people use this system, and we haven't had a single question about it. Not a single person has hit help. So that's actually pretty good for us. The fact that 1,400 people tried something completely new, and no one has yet hit a problem with it. So this, in terms of our funder support, is the first step on the road to resolving what, quite frankly, is a pretty messy situation. We're currently building relationships with new funding organizations that we haven't previously dealt with, or we're building different types of relationships with institutions that we do have existing relationships with. We're trying to manage the flow of money and publishing activity by spreadsheet, and we know that that's happening at the university and the funder end as well, and also that universities and funders are having to do this with multiple versions of, of us. So our next top priority is to create a single resource for funders in which they can come in, see the progress of the articles that they may be funding or otherwise publishing through systems with us. Um, and it will also carry many more metrics that we believe that funders and institutions are involved in. So demonstrating the integrity of the process, making sure that there are advanced metrics that are available, and we're working on a project with Fundref in collaboration with, with other publishers as well to make sure that those are consistent across publishers. So there's a single level of understanding of what that means. 
So finally, we also need to adopt financial rigor. Um, we've already talked a little bit, of, or heard a little bit about efficiency this morning. If we're to achieve the RCUK orderly transition, it's not time yet to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but help move all this through to achieve that endpoint. Um, so we've been proactively working on open access, uh, both publications and infrastructure now for a little over three years. Um, and we've been thinking very hard within that as well about the, what the future holds for an organization like the one I work for in an open access future. First of all, we're almost certainly going to be in a mixed economy of gold, green and subscriptions. Um, we are going to be seeing increasing research output over the next few years. It may not always feel like it, but the, the rate of article output is increasing all the time as research funding increases. And we've made the assumption, um, which is, I think, a valid one, that the amount of money available in the system for scholarly communications at the very best will remain static, if not decline. Now, if that's true, it means we have to publish more for less. And that means we absolutely have to find efficiencies in the system. And I don't expect, by the way, anyone to lose sleep for publishers over any of this. It's up to us to find a way in which we can do that without diminishing any of those standards I've previously referred to. In our case, this also means we have to support around 800 learned societies in making that transition. Uh, societies are a particular force, of course, in the UK, and many of them are heavily reliant on their publishing activities to support their other um, endeavors. So essentially, we all need to find ways in which we can increase the efficiencies within the system. We need to reduce redundancy, first of all. So, for example, not subjecting articles to multiple layers of peer review at different journals at different times. We need to stop investing in the technologies of the old, like print. Um, we would be very happy to see the end of print as well. There are still forces out there that keep us investing in print. If we can shift that investment towards the newer technologies and deliver the kind of future that Sir Mark referenced earlier in terms of the way that people will be interacting with the publication, the data that underlie it, and all the other features and functionalities you can engage, the world will be a better place for everybody, I'm sure. We have to be financially responsible as well to our customers. We need to find, as publishers, clear and transparent ways of demonstrating to libraries that they are not paying for open access content in subscription-based journals. And that has to happen really, really soon. So in closing, I just wanted to reinforce the fact that this transition is well underway. We're a part of it. We want to do it in such a way that we're able to maintain those standards of excellence that I hope we've been able to do for the past few years and that we end up in a position where scholarly communications are financially sustainable long into the future. <laughs>